autism sort of in the same group, right? So communication and social interaction are the categories that you have to have differences in, significant differences in, in order to be um, diagnosed with autism. So one of the things is social emotional reciprocity. We're gonna talk about all these things more after these slides. Um, deficits in verbal and nonverbal communication for social interaction, deficits <coughs> in developing and maintaining and understanding relationships. Also, the third area is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. So you might see some stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, kind of like the um, the stereotype, our stereotype for this kind of thing is like this kind of like stimming with your fingers. Um, so anything that they do over and over again, um, they might um, use objects in the same way over and over again, or they might say things over and over again, or they might make sounds like dicka 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 dicka. I have lots of kids who make that sound. I don't know why they like it, but they do. Um, they might, you might see an insistence on sameness and routines or ritualized verbal and nonverbal behaviors. Highly restricted, fixated interests. I'm only interested in talking about spaceships and that's all I can talk about because I can't think about anything else. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Um, or hypo and hypersensitivity <coughs> to sensory input. So the lights are too bright, no matter what lights they are, or you can shine lights in my eyes and I don't even notice. Okay, so that's hyper and hypo. Most of us are kind of in the middle, you know, of that. So what you guys want to know is, what can we do to help our kids and our grandkids? Um, so we're going to look at each of the categories and talk a little bit more about them and then some things that we can do to support them. So with the verbal communication, we see lack of speech without compensation. And what that means is sometimes children have a language delay, but they can communicate with you. Right? They point and they use their face and they do all kinds of things to try to get you to understand them. That's with compensation. Kids with autism don't tend to do that. Okay, so they have a lack of speech or a language delay and they're not um, trying in the same way to make up for it. They may communicate with you by taking your hand to get something, but it's not really about communication and connection. It's about, I know that you can get that thing, so please get it, you know. Um, but, so that's what we see, okay? We also see language delays, which I said, the inability to initiate or sustain conversation, stereotyped or repetitive conversation. If they ask me that question, then I'm gonna lose my mind. Sometimes my kids ask questions all the time, the same question. Mm -hmm. um, an odd rhythm or rate or pitch of speech. Sometimes our kids talk really high. We don't know why, but that sometimes that happens. Or they might sound um, very professory, or they might sound a little robotic. Um, and then a lot of difficulty with figurative language, like I have ants in my pants, or it's raining cats and dogs, like anything like that, they take kind of literally, they don't realize there's like an alternate meaning to it. Um, affectionately, we call them literal lads. That's what I call them, literal lads, you are so cute. Let me teach you what that really means. <laughs> um, they're trying so hard to understand, just literally, just the way they're taking it. Um, so what we can do to help with verbal communication besides you know, speech therapy and that sort of thing, which you probably already explored, is get their attention before talking to them. Don't assume that if you call them across the room that they're gonna turn and come to you, okay? You will make yourself mental if you decide that's the thing, the pill that you're gonna fall on. Because they're so kind of like in their own world that they may not, they really don't hear you. They really don't hear you. So just go to them, touch them, so they know that you're talking to them, and then if they decide not to do what you're asking them to do, you're like, okay, you're deciding not to. But if you're doing it from across the room, I just don't recommend it. I just don't recommend it for anybody. It's hard for you and for them. Um, use short and direct communication. Please pick that up. Instead of, why do you keep leaving your things on the floor? If you leave them there, I'm gonna step on them. You need to pick them up and put them back in your room. Like we do, right? Just Pick up the toy, please. <laughs> Short, direct. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that you don't want to expose them to more language, but if you want them to do something, it's better to be direct and short with it because they're having a hard time 
taking in language, interpreting it, and then making their body do what it is that you're wanting them to do. It's a lot harder and arduous. So if we're short and direct, it's helpful. Um, give them longer to respond to you when you're asking them to do something. If a lot of times their processing is slower. Like I said, they're taking in the language and they're processing, processing. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, now what do I need to do? If you keep telling them over and over what to do, that process starts over. So I used to work with a student and I would tell him, so I was working with him at his house and we were putting weights silverware and I was like, butter knife's in. And I would, to myself, I would go one, two, three, four, five. At about five or six, he would start moving. If I said butter knife's in, Better than I sent, like he would stand there forever because he couldn't like get to the part where he moved because I kept giving him more information. So that's a little bit extreme, but it's just something to kind of remember. Like if they're not doing what I want them to do, maybe they're still processing. Maybe I use too many words. Maybe they need some picture cues to help them understand what I'm saying. So kind of always go for if it's what they're doing isn't what you want them to do, they're not understanding. Let me make sure I give them all the supports I can to make sure they're understanding before I decide to be irritated. Well, you might be irritated on the inside, but before you decide to tell them that you're irritated. <laughs> okay. Um, explain figurative. That's what, if they fail to respond, give them more support. That's what I meant by like picture support or showing them. Explain figurative language um, and then keep talking. Keep talking to them. Okay. Nonverbal communication. So this is kind of a classic. They may have limited eye contact. Um, a lot of times people will say, they don't know what to do when they look at my eyes. And I'm like, well. <laughs> um, sometimes our kids look at other people's eyes too long mm -hmm. instead of not looking. Or they look and look away and look and look away. And we so desperately don't want as parents want that to be true, that we're like, no, they're looking at us. But an outsider might be like, well, sort of, a little bit. Um, inability to read facial expressions and body language, we see that. So when you are steaming mad and your other kids are like, stay out of her way. Um, your toddler inspector may not even notice at all that, that you're steaming mad. But kids who are what we call neurotypical, their neurological development is typical, um, they notice. <laughs> They can tell by your face, by the way you're standing, by the way your phone is. Um, so that's something to remember too. They might themselves have limited facial expressions or gestures. Um, they may not look to adults for so or peers for social feedback. So you may not get a lot of like, hey, look what I'm doing, or here, I did this, or that kind of thing. Um, not because they don't love you or want to share with you, it just doesn't occur to them naturally, okay? Um, and in infants, sometimes you see like a lack of social smile or they look at your eyes, I mean your mouth instead of your eyes. So typically infants connect with your eyes, but sometimes our kids with autism, like even when they're infants, are looking at your mouth and not at your eyes. I'm not entirely sure why that happens, but it's something that people have done research on. So we can encourage them to look toward us okay or at something that we're talking about so that we kind of know that we have their attention but i would not ever require them to look at to say you have to look at my eyes i know that feels very disrespectful we're in the south and that feels really disrespectful <laughs> but because of their sensory processing when they're looking at your eyes sometimes that means they can't hear what you're saying because they're trying so hard to focus on the eyes and what they're taking in with their vision that they can't also use their ears at the same time. And I know that sounds crazy, but it, it's true. Um, so I just talked to somebody the other day and they were saying, yeah, his, his granddad gets so frustrated, but he looks at him when he's gonna talk to him, but then he looks down and to the side and then he does whatever he asks him to do. But if he makes him look at him in the eyes, he cannot process the language. And it's not the same for every kid, but if the child that you're interacting with is having difficulty with that, it's okay. It's okay. Um, a way we can help them with nonverbal communication is calling attention to our faces and labeling our emotions. So when you are seen, <laughs> look at mama's face, it's red. Do you see my eyebrows? 
I'm angry, <laughs> you know, um, so that they can have that exposure and have exposure to the language also and how it connects with what your face looks like. And you can do the same thing with them if they're not too upset, um, if they're having positive emotion. Oh, I know you're happy because you're smiling and show them in the mirror. Look, you're smiling. I know you're happy. Your face tells me that you're happy. Like we have to teach them that people's faces get have information. Okay? That's something that you could do. Um, for building interaction, um, we can do some things because our kids sometimes appear aloof, like they don't really care if there are people around. Um, they might fail to develop peer relationships. Um, they may not seek to share enjoyment or interest with others, and they might be appear to use others for a practical purpose. That's what I meant when I said like they take your hand and they put it up there. Um, they're just kind of you. They it seems like oh, they just care about me getting that for them. Well, it's because they don't know how to interact in a more personal way. So um, if the child you're interacting with seems that way, like aloof or not really caring that you're there, um, you can kind of start by, we call it invading their play, by sitting next to them, playing with your own things next to them, um, and then playing, try to use the, so they're playing Legos, you bring the cars. You're playing with the cars, you're not messing with their stuff, you're just playing next to them. They're learning to tolerate you being there and maybe even see that it's fun. Um, like you could be using your car and be like, here I come, you know, don't mess up their legos, but come around. Um, just kind of get them to interact with you. And then you want to try to use the same materials that they're using, right? Um, and then maybe build something together, your turn, my turn. I put it on, now your turn, my turn, your turn, and try to build something together. Um, you can also, um, for the relationship part, you can pair siblings or peers with a preferred item. So um, it's so if they really love Legos, and their brother their brother can maybe be the one who has the best Legos, so they want to be with the brother because of the Legos. But then after they interact a lot, then they kind of start developing a relationship. So. I mean, a lot of kids are like this anyways, where they go for the objects first, like you have the candy. So I'm the lady that has the mints at church. <laughs> Does anybody can have a mint? Does anybody can have a mint? Well, they call it candy. Can I have a candy? So at first they love me because of the candy, right? But then later I start telling them no, and they still love me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that idea, <laughs> okay? Um, you can also um, interpret their actions for them when they're playing. Um, so if... If they're building, like you can just say like, oh, you're building a house, I like your house. So you're like kind of modeling, commenting for them. Um, and kids do this with each other, like, oh, you have the red one, or oh, yours is tall, or that kind of thing. And they like it, right, when their friends say those kind of things. And so when we teach our kids with autism to say those kind of things about what somebody else is doing, it builds a connection. Even if it's just from the other side, now somebody's like coming towards them. Right, and that's going to help them out in those peer relationships. Yes, absolutely. Um, so for um, social emotional reciprocity, that's a two-way relationship. Okay, um, they really need our help and understanding how inter how to interact. Oh, that should have an S on it. How interactions and relationships work. Um, so we can start by teaching them simple turn taking, your turn, my turn. If you have like um, someone who hasn't done that before, we do it like this. Your turn, my turn, your turn. <laughs> right? Their turn is a lot longer than yours because you're building trust. They, Because of the lack of language, they haven't noticed how that works. So when you take something from them, in their mind, it's gone forever. They're never getting it back. Meltdown, right? So we're trying to teach them, you can trust me, I'm gonna give it back to you, you know? So you do longer and longer turns, and when it's your turn, you um, kind of try to make it fun for them so that they're still attending to you, and they give it back to them, and they have a turn. And we do this in school all the time, and then we try to make the turns longer, and you know, farther and farther apart until they can tolerate it more. Um, and then take turns with other kids. Kids are not as reliable as adults, right? Which is one of the reasons our kids prefer adult relationships, <laughs> because they're much more accommodating and reliable. Kids are not so much. 
Um, so also turn, take, turn taking is really important for play, for games, right? Um, for, it's also important for language. Turn taking um, is important for language. You don't want them to monopolize. If you have a child with a lot of language, you don't want them to monopolize the conversation, right? So it's just a, a it seems like a simple skill, but it's a really foundational for a lot of other things after that. Um, we can use think alouds to tell them what you're thinking. So here's what we found is that um, our kids on the spectrum think that your thoughts are the same as their thoughts. Mm -hmm. They just don't know. So um, it's helpful if when you're walking around and you know you stub your toe and like, oh, I stubbed my toe. I'm thinking about maybe, do I need to get some ice? Or I didn't, so that they understand that the things that you're thinking about are different. It also models for them how you um, solve problems. Most of us solve problems in our heads first. We're not talking about them all the time. So it's really a mystery to them. Like, how did you solve that problem? Mm -hmm. They have no idea. But if you're saying it out loud as you're solving the problem, you're modeling that process for them. And that's also really helpful. Um, we want to teach how to start and end and interrupt conversations and how to join a group is so important. Right? You don't just barge into a group. Um, so it's important to teach. And it, it can be taught. Just take some time. Um, so with this category of stereotyped movement, speech, or object use, you might see some of these things. I'm sure that some of those are familiar to you. So typically those things are just um, the flapping of the hands and the flickering of the fingers and all of those things are an attempt to calm their system, their nervous system, okay? And to help, and if their nervous system is in check and calm, then they feel more in control. They're able to make better decisions. There's less impulsivity and that sort of thing, right? So um, it may feel like, oh, I don't want them to do that, or I don't want them to do that in public, or I don't want them to do whatever. Um, so if the behavior cannot be tolerated in whatever environment, we wanna to try to give them an alternative behavior that'll meet the same need. Okay, um, or teach them how to do it in an appropriate way. So like, I heard this woman speak um, one time and she was, I mean, she worked for, she was a corporate something, something, I can't remember now. But when she would get overwhelmed, she would go into the bathroom, close the stall, sit down and just do this until she was calm. And she just learned like, I need this in order to calm down, but I can do it in the bathroom stall and nobody will see me and it won't affect my job. <laughs> You know, so she obviously has a lot of language and a lot of skill, but um, sometimes it, you don't have to get rid of it. You just have to um, have it in the right environment. But if you're needing to be calm um, in a place where it may not be appropriate, some kind of fidget might be appropriate. I mean, have you ever been somewhere and there's a long talk and you see a paper clip and you start playing with a paper clip, right? And you do it kind of like to stay attentive to what's happening or to stay awake. Um, or sometimes if you're doing that and looking down, you're like actually taking in the information more appropriate, not more appropriately, but like um, better. Um, so sometimes that's helpful to um, help them regulate. Um, we want to help them build on repetitive speech. So if they're saying things over and over again, um, we want to help build on that. So. Um, if they're saying, no, 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 then you can say things like, no, I don't like ice cream. No, I don't, you know, like, or no, you're wrong. I like that or something. Like you could just expand whatever it is they're saying um, as a model for them so that they can see like, oh, I have this word and it can be useful, you know. Um, also just, if they have an occupational therapist, work with that person to help meet their sensory needs. Um, in some appropriate ways. Often um, students with autism receive occupational therapy at school or outside of school. They may receive speech in school or outside or both, both of those things. You can have things in school and outside of school because the things that they, the therapies they receive in school are just to help them access the curriculum, but they might have other deficits 
that are causing a lot of problems in life in general, but it's not keeping them from accessing school, right? So they can get outside therapy to help with those things, and that's like a medical, it's called a medical model and an educational model. So sometimes kids get both things. All right, that was really long. Okay, so rituals and insisting on routines. Um, they might have some behavioral rituals and rules, insistence on things being done the same way. They might completely panic when schedule changes or there are changes in the environment. So it is helpful to establish routines. If you'll establish a routine, maybe the routine will be something that you can tolerate <laughs> instead of them establishing it and then you trying to undo it. Um, but all children benefit from structure and routine. We benefit from structure and routine. Um, use schedules and lists. Um, schedules for after school, for Saturday, for Sunday, for the morning, like get up, brush your teeth, put your clothes on, go potty, like whatever the thing is. Um, if the children can read, then it can be printed. If they can't, you can use pictures. There's all kinds of things on Google that you can find if you need to. <laughs> um, but it's really, really helpful. It helps them predict what's gonna happen so they can feel more grounded and safe, okay? Because their prediction skills are really poor compared to kids who are neurotypical. It's really hard for them to anticipate what everybody else is doing in the room. Um, so having schedules and lists at least is one way to help them kind of feel more grounded so they can react to other things a little bit more appropriately. Um, providing advanced warning and change of routine is really great if you could do it. Um, helping them organize and maintain their space is also helpful. So they might be a disaster with all of their things. <clears throat> but um, probably they won't be able to find what they need in the disaster. So I don't know if you or you have some friends who, like their office is a mess, but they know where everything is, right? But our kids on autism spectrum, that isn't normally what happens. Normally it's a mess and then everything is visually overwhelming and they're like out. They're like, I'm not even gonna look for it. I can't find it. <laughs> so teaching some organizational skills so they can't find what they need is helpful. Um, restricted interests can be fun, um, but also can be annoying um, also. Um, but you might see some preoccupation with parts of objects or unusual use of toys when kids are little. So they might pick up the car and all they do is play with the wheel, they spin the wheel instead of rolling the car, okay? That would be they're fixed on the wheel, not on, other kids would be playing with the car in a different way. Um, you see a lack of shared imaginary play or very rigid imaginary play. So that, and that is part of, they think that their thoughts are your thoughts. And so they don't get the turn taking of imaginary play. Um, for some of them, it's even hard to do the imagination part of it. Um, that can be taught, but um, it's difficult. And then we have like a fixation on limited topics. <laughs> Like I said about like the spaceships or trains is a big family thing. trees, Legos. family trees, Legos, uh huh, yeah, <coughs> drains, sewage systems, like fans, turbines, all kinds of things I have seen, um, and, and often they know a lot about it. I mean, like crazy amounts, and you're just like, wow, how did you know that? Um, so um, when they're younger and they're not playing with toys like quote appropriately, you can play beside them again, model. You don't want to try to force them to change the way they're playing with it, but you want to kind of show them that it's fun to play with it a different way, right? Um, because none of us responds really well when somebody forces us to change, right? <laughs> but if somebody leads us into change gently, we're much more apt to receive that, right? Um, so we want to um, model cooperative and imaginary play to help expand their interest in other things. And we want to support, we can use their restricted interests to support peer interaction um, by pairing them with peers who like the same kinds of things that they do, which is really helpful. Um, and we can use their interests to build social interaction and academic skills. So that just means, you know, if I'm needing you, if you hate reading, if what you're reading is spaceships, you're much more likely to be interested in doing it, right? 
So we just kind of use their special interests as a way to help develop other skills along the way. Um, the other thing is we, we do teach our kids who have a lot of language as they get older to feign interest in what other people are saying because we all do it. We all do it. Somebody's talking to us and we're alive. I cannot wait until this is over. I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm not, like, really. Or, or like, that's fascinating. I know she loves that, but I really don't want to hear about that anymore. But you just nod and you smile because you're kind, and then the conversation is over and you move on, right? Um, our kids don't know that people are doing that because they don't know what's in your mind and they don't know you're doing it. So we have to be very obvious about like, this is what people do and it's nice to do this because when you're talking about trains, they may not want to listen to you, but that's what they're doing because they want to be your friend. You know, so you need to do that for them and be their friend. Um, let's see. Channeling their interests into strengths is also, I mean, use it for all it's worth, because if they love it, um, you might be able to build on it for work, or for career, or for college, or for just, you know, you just don't know, but it's good to tap into those. All right, so sensory needs. They might avoid or limit some kinds of sensory input. They need, might need like higher intensity of some, um, or maybe acceptable ways to seek types of input, and we kind of talked about that already. Um, and the sensory, sensory input is touch, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, um, kind of like, you know when somebody hugs you that you really love for a long time, how that feels really good and you kind of like relax. Um, we call that deep pressure. Um, sometimes our kids are needing that. Our kids who run into walls, um, like on purpose, or run into things like the back of the couch or things like that, they're kind of seeking that hard sensory input because their neurological system is not working the way they need it to, and it helps them organize. So we really try to, again, work with their occupational therapist and have give them some the input that they need or limit the input that they need. So if lights are too much, we teach kids to wear caps. Um, or if in their room we could change the light bulb from fluorescent to a dimmer bulb, um, just those kinds of things that you can make modifications for that like, and if it bothers you, like, well, I don't wanna make everything so special for them. Well, I would for myself, right, as an adult. <laughs> so it's okay, it's okay to make some changes. For headphones, for, for like noise canceling. Yes, so you might see kids with autism with headphones on, they're noise canceling headphones. They can still hear you, it just mutes it a little bit, and they don't hear all of the like, paper rattling and all the other kind of things that are in the environment. That can be really helpful. Um, so we can help by, as much as we can, giving them a calm, predictable environment. Um, give them a way to escape discreetly. So if you're going to a party, a birthday party, and you know that birthday parties are overwhelming because of the noise and the movement, people moving a lot, um, the expectation to interact, all of those things are like really stressful. Um, you can kind of agree, if your child has enough language for this, you can agree beforehand, like if you start getting upset or whatever, meet me over here and we'll leave. Or walk out and stand right outside the door and I'll come with you. Um, so that we don't have a meltdown, right? Um, if they don't have that kind of language, you need to decide ahead of time, how are we gonna escape? <laughs> and then you watch them <laughs> and then you get them out. Okay, because they don't like it either. They don't like to melt down in front of people. Um, so, I mean, and the adults don't like it, but the child themselves also do not like it. It does not feel good. Um, so we want to provide the things that they need. Trampolines are often something that our kids are seeking, that kind of input from your feet hitting. Some of our kids with autism jump a lot, and that's why they're jumping, to get that input through their feet all the way up. It organizes your neurological system. It's great. Um, crash pads instead of the wall. Crash pads are just like these big, kind of like a bean bag, but they're really big. Um, and when they're using them like with an occupational therapist, there's actually like a little stand they stand on and then they jump like as hard as they can. Um, and they do like these kinds of things and then they go back to class more organized and able to attend better. That's the goal. That's why they're doing it. All right. 
You might see weighted items also. Weighted blankets are a big thing now for like the general public, um, but it gives you that calm feeling like when somebody's hugging you. Or sometimes they have um, like stuffed animals or other things that they hold in their lap that just helps them feel more centered, which is also great for our typical people. It works for everybody. So those are just really briefly the kind of the areas and some things that you can do or think about doing um, to help. So um, I'm sure there, there might be questions, but before we do that, I want to show you this. Um, Partners Resource Network, and it's on your handout, is a really good resource. Not just for, not, it's not autism specific, but it's really good for information about special education. <coughs> and they have, their whole goal is to empower parents like give parents information and they have tons of like little webinars you can do things that you can go to it's really great does everybody know like what this is this is a QR code you don't have to use this you can just Google partners resource network okay and look for their newsletter but if you hold your camera on your phone over that it'll pop it up for you all right there is, um, there are some special education updates coming. Um, oh, sorry, already gone, that was the 20th. Mm -hmm. All right, but this hasn't happened yet. Okay, so in Brian ISD, <laughs> we have some parent education classes that anyone who's supporting an individual with autism or any disability can come to, okay? So Purposeful Life is something that we do with College Station ISD, with Texas A&M, with Independent Fresno Valley Center for Independent Living with the Down Syndrome Association. So we all collaborate and we come together. And once a month we meet at Central Church and we have dinner. If you register, we have dinner and childcare and a class um, called Young Advocates for our students with disabilities to kind of learn something like what the parents are learning. Um, and this next one is really good. It's gonna be a mom and a son and it's kind of about self-advocacy, about him talking about like learning what he likes and how to express that and how to get what he needs at school um, and to have his, to have a say, right? He's, I don't know, 16, 17, something like that. Um, and he's an individual with autism. And the parenting on the spectrum is something that I do in Brian with College Station. We do it together, but it's, we have it in Brian. Um, and the next one is October 10th and this is Challenging Behaviors Part 1 going to be a part two in November. So all of you are welcome to come to that. And can I just say that they have been lifesavers for us, both of those things. So I would highly encourage anyone who uh, needs to, to go. So we still go to the um, Purposeful Life every month. We love it. Even when we've heard it, uh, my mom came a couple months ago and was amazed at all these people who have been raising these special needs kids and then have to put $3,000 out uh, when they become an adult to become their, um, their legal guardian again. And how, how crazy that is, but how important it is for, the, for some kids with special needs. So anyway, it has a lot of really great information. And then of course, Stephanie's is always good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, we have some time for some questions. If somebody has a question or if you want, I can just, if you have a personal question, I can be here and you can ask that. If you have some general questions that you want to ask in front of the group. Uh -huh. So our grandson, he, he's adopted, and he was basically starved as a little child. And so he has so many eating. Everything is centered around food. He's now eight. Is there some way um, to combat that? I mean, it's just, it's ongoing. It's like their whole everything is centered around food. Like he won't eat? No, he wants to eat everything and oh. everybody else's food and just like he can't get enough. And he's just big around. And yeah, it's ongoing. Wow. Has he, have y'all talked to his doctor about the fact that he doesn't ever feel full? Um, 
So I think they have, they just moved from Kentucky. From Kentucky. He was, you know, uh, in foster care there. And so everything, so they're trying to get him in some programs in spring. Oh, uh -huh. so is where yeah. they have moved to. So um, I don't know what they've done, but it's their ongoing, the biggest issue. Yeah. How old is he? He's eight. He's eight. Uh -huh. Does he have a lot of language or no? Does he talk? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot. Okay. So um, sometimes, so we use this tool called a social story with our kids on the spectrum, often, um, and it's just a factual, calm way to give them information, okay? So they could, and it, does he get any kind of like outside therapy? Like They're trying to. Yeah, somebody who can. But you can, Kentucky they could, uh -huh. but um, here in, in Houston area, they're trying to get him in, but there's like a huge waiting list. Right, but well, you can just Google social stories. Okay, so there's a specific way to write them. Mm -hmm. You could write that about eating, you could write one about eating. You or you probably can find one. Yeah, you might be eating. able to find one. Some of them aren't real social stories, but um, you can find lots of things on Google. But um, you could also um, work on kind of a, this is the rule for eating. So like a divided plate and everybody gets this. Yeah, so, but I mean, yeah. They've already tried that. Oh, they've tried all So kind of something, things. I don't know if they've heard of these social stories, but they have saved us so many things. So when it's written down, it's like it's gospel truth. If I say it, it's not, but if it's written down, it's gospel truth. Okay. And so we have written so many social stories for our son that have worked. In fact, something that um, one of these purposeful life was on it, in it they had this book called a five is against the law which might be something that would be good it, the book is called a five is against the law and so you have these different levels of behavior one is like green you are good this is this your good behavior this is and then it just goes up from there and a five is against the law and we use that with Noah because he was actually taking people's wallets out of their pockets. And we were like, and when he read that book and then we had that social story, he realized a five was against the law. So then if he was going to reach into someone's pocket, we were like, five Noah, that's a five. And it really helped him. And so then when they brought that topic up again, I don't know, in the spring, we, they just had the topic again. Noah came back from the youth one where he went to the youth one and he said, I remembered about the five being against the law. And I'm so, you know, like he, he remembered it. He was glad to revisit this information. And so it might be a really good book for them to get. Okay. Because that is against the law. And it will eventually become against the law, stealing food from other people. Right? Right. Right. So it's really good. It's a it's a good place, I think. Yeah. And the thing about social stories is that it takes all the emotion out. Yes. Because for me right? too. For yes, you too. exactly. It takes what? All the emotion all out. All the emotion out. out. Okay, so we're just giving them factual information. So they're not having to interpret. So they're angry at him when he steals from other people. But the social story takes that emotion away. This is it's what the social story says. This is what it says. You can't take other people's food. It's against the law. So we're going to follow this. Oh, that was against the law. That's a five. Like, no emotion. That's a five. You, we got to have a consequence for that five. No emotion. That's what it says. Yeah. So, so social stories are great for that reason. You can reference them. It takes the emotion out for the adult. And it also takes emotion out of them having to, like, read your emotion while you're talking to them and frustrated with them and all of those things. Um, it also gives them something visual. Visual information doesn't leave unless you lose the book. But when you talk, your words go into the air, and now they're gone. So if they didn't catch it, it's gone. They have no idea what you said. Um, but if it's written down or there's a picture of it, then that information stays. You know, it's just like um, if somebody tells you how to get somewhere, 
and they say go to the first light and turn right. And then, then. some people are auditory have good auditory memory, and they're like. I'm like, no, you gotta write that down, or I've gotta write it down. Write it down, <laughs> right? Because now it's gone. It, it went in my ears, and now it's gone. So it's a little bit the same. The same thing with the schedule. Sometimes the schedule is amazing because you can say, oh, the schedule says, right? Right. So it takes out the fight of you trying to get them to do something, um, and they're like, oh. Again, exactly. it's about the emotion. It's, it's about emotion. them trying to interpret the words and the emotion at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're not always great at regulating our own emotions, right? When we're telling kids to do something. Right. Um, so <laughs> it's just a very helpful tool. <laughs> it's a helpful tool. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Does anybody else have any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Mary. <laughs> well, can I just say that as a uh, somebody who stood back and watched Becky and Chris work with Noah, they have uh, they really helped him and Bob and I have seen such a change in him and I can say Stephanie has been a huge encouragement that. and help for them. I just know this when I, I'm looking, I mean I'm a yeah. bystander, really. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're yeah. in it now. <laughs> Sorry, you're not a bystander She moved anymore. next door. She's in oh. <laughs> <laughs> What were you going to say? I was just going to say consistency is so important. Yes. 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 Yeah. Consistency is so important. I have a question about, um, we're talking about resetting their nervous system. That's uh -huh. what their stimming mm -hmm. activities are. Have you seen any kind of, or I don't know, I've just seen on social media, you know, this Vegas <coughs> reset kind of oh, I haven't read about exercises. That. Uh -huh. and, it's, and it's, you know, you're, you're sitting and you stretch, but your eyes are looking this way and your body is facing, you know, different kind of things uh -huh. like that. I was just wondering if that has... Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read about that. So good heard about good that. luck trying to get them to I do know, that. I know, I know. Like, how do you get them to... I know. <laughs> but maybe I want to do it for myself. I know. Uh, <laughs> I think you can say that, though, because my son naturally does that. Like, yeah. he does this and then he's in circles. And mm. then he's like, so I'm... Yeah, and so I'm he's, he's like, looking this way and he's doing this? Yeah. 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 I just, yeah, I just wanted to mention a couple other things, and I think it's really good. So uh, we have a gal from Believe Therapies here, and therapy, you know, like occupational therapy and physical therapy are really good for these kids. Uh, speech therapy, so Noah's, Noah, who talks up a storm and you can't get him stopping, stop talking, he still gets speech therapy because he can't seem to, like, take it in or get it out correctly and so he's still getting speech therapy but in the and in, in a and lot of it can i say what it is yes please a lot of his um speech therapy is what we call pragmatics he's learning how to have a conversation back and forth and what's yes. appropriate to say and how to like how to introduce yourself and how to comment on what somebody mm -hmm. else said and um, how to make the conversation keep going Yes, and so you know, if you're interested, there you know, there's therapy for that. Um, the other thing we have used is um, Courtney Cares. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but it's horseback riding, mm -hmm. and it's horseback riding therapy. Yeah. And there's a A and M has this Courtney Cares. You have to get on their waiting list, but it's free. And so if you can get on the waiting list, you can just Google Courtney Cares and email them. If you can get on the waiting list, it is amazing. Um, when Noah has finished horseback riding for the day, his the rest of his day is calm. It's wow. crazy because he got and, all of that sensory input on yeah. the horse. So he's he's a stiff kid all the time. He's stiff, yes. but you see him on that horse, and he's like moving with the horse, and it's amazing to watch. It's really significant. So anyway, just something to think about for anyone who has someone or has a grandchild or whatever, it's a great program here in town if they're here. I'll just say we use belief therapies. Oh. Speech, OT, and what was the PT. PT. And we've been there for three years and wow. love them. They love the kids and are very, very good at their jobs. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, before I go, I want to tell you about, this is not related to autism, but another part of my job is to um, make sure that our students who are in foster care 
um, not in a home foster care like where you would have one or two children in your home foster care, but who live in a residential treatment facility in North Bryan. Um, and their parents, rights have been terminated and um, they receive special education or they have a 504 plan, they have to have a neutral party act as parent in their meetings where we make decisions. So the place where they live can't make decisions for them for special education and we, the school, can't make those decisions for them. There needs to be like a separate person. Like me, right? So um, we have some, <laughs> like, she just left. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, you guys are fine. Just no one's talking about um, So anyways, I'm always looking for volunteers. The time commitment is once a month to go to school, meet the kiddo. Beth, is she gone? Yeah, she did leave. Beth was a surrogate parent for me. Um, these are all boys, fifth grade to 12th grade. You go to school, meet with them once a month, build rapport, hang out with them, check it, do you have what you need, um, how's school going, that kind of thing, and then you go to their meetings and you sign as parent. Um, and there's a one and a half hour online training about special education. So if you, if somebody's coming to mind or you yourself are interested, I have these brochures, it has my information. And the, you said you go to meetings. Is it the one meeting, IEP meeting a year? Or well, what? so so these guys are in a residential treatment facility for behavior. Mm -hmm. So every time they get in a fight, you have to have a meeting. Oh, gotcha. So sometimes you get kids who don't get in fights at school and they just, have difficulty in the home, like you see the behaviors there and not at school, right? Um, so it could be just one meeting a year, it could be five or six, you yeah. know. Um, but you can do them on the phone, you can do video conferencing, or you can like go to the school. So if you have a heart for that or you know somebody who does, please take one of these and um, it has my, have a little label down here that has my contact info. Okay. All right, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.